Hello, dear friends in Bulgaria and all over the world, and welcome. You're watching the TV show Visible and Invisible, Counter Propaganda. I'm Svet Dineham. Russian aggression against Ukraine is also an attack against the free world. Philosophy of autocracy is on the battlefield against the philosophy of democracy. International order established after World War II is put at stake. How dangerous is this new evil axis between authoritarian countries to our world, to the way of life we have accustomed ourselves to? Today, I'm excited to talk to a very distinguished special guest on these issues. Professor Janusz Bugajski is a senior fellow at the Jamestown Foundation in Washington, D.C. He hosted several long-running television show broadcasts in the Balkans, has authored 21 books on Europe, Russia, and transatlantic relations, and is a columnist for several media outlets. His recent books include Failed State, A Guide to Russia's Rupture, Eurasian Disunion, Russia's Vulnerable Flanks with Margarita Senova, Conflict Zones, North Caucasus and Western Balkans Compared, and Return of the Balkans, Challenges to European Integration and U.S. Disengagement. His upcoming book to be published by the Jamestown Foundation is titled Pivotal Poland, Europe's Rising Strategic Player. Mr. Bogajski has been a senior fellow at the Center for European Policy Analysis and was director of the new European Democracies Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. He has served as consultant for the U.S. Department of Defense, the U.S. Agency for International Development, and a course chair for Central Europe and South Central Europe Area Studies at the Foreign Service Institute, U.S. Department of State. He has testified before several congressional committees, including Helsinki Commission, Senate Foreign Relations, Senate Armed Services, House Foreign Affairs, and House Defense Appropriations. Welcome, Professor Bugajski. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the long introduction. <laughs> well, we tried to 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 make your uh, actually very long view kind of uh, shorter, and uh, um, our um, audience all over the world and and in Bulgaria actually has been following you, and they know that your bio is much more uh, uh, longer, and um, you have particular also focus on on the Balkans. But let us start with the very recent, very, very recent developments considering Ukraine. Uh, the visit of President Zelensky in UK and in Brussels uh, meeting both with UK leaders and then in Brussels with European leaders. Um, some military experts for the past year have been observing the so-called phenomenon of uh, um, drip funding, drip aid uh, to Ukraine, uh, what they call it like um, little by little at the time. Uh, my question is, um, we see now an obvious increase in the quality of weapons delivered to Ukraine. But will Ukraine receive sufficient military aid, uh, sufficient enough, not only in terms of uh, quality, but in terms of uh, quantity as well? And will we see the end of this era of, of uh, this phenomenon of drip aid? Yeah, uh, good question. It, it's three things. It's quality of military aid, quantity of military aid, but also speed of military aid is very important. Uh, as we know, Russia is preparing uh, a new offensive uh, in the Donbass. They want to take, Putin has ordered them to take the Donbass by the end of February or by March, and they're building up their forces. They're building up these... Uh, uh, mobilized uh, civilians from all over the country. So Ukraine needs to prevent that counteroffensive from from capturing uh, more Ukrainian territory, but at the same time stage its own offensive to gain back ter vital territories in eastern Ukraine. For that purpose, it needs better weapons. It needs longer range uh, missiles, including the ATACMs. It's even asking for F-16 uh, warplanes. Um, the longer range missiles, by the way, are important to strike uh, in the logistical corridors, logistical uh, pipelines uh, that, that uh, enable Russia to provide fuel, ammunition, food, 
uh, spare parts, whatever it is, to their military machine. So Ukraine has been saying, if you provide those weapons to us as quickly as possible, we'll be able to prevent a major Russian offensive. To answer your bigger question, that's been the problem right from the beginning. It was bit by bit, as Russia built up its forces, we only gave bit by bit in terms of military assistance. If we had given Ukraine some of the capabilities they have now, I think the Russian assault would not have been successful in Zaporizhia or in Kherson. Uh, or other parts of Donbass. Hopefully now this is changing. Zelensky's trip, as you mentioned, uh, to Brussels and London was um, uh, was intended to speed up the, the supply of important equipment. In fact, the British Prime Minister said, we're not talking now about months, we're talking about weeks, if not days, that you get what you need. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I also hope for the best this time. Um, what do you think? Is there some hidden red line between the West and Russia? Uh, some military experts say that Dnipro River is this real hidden red line between the West and Russia. Do you think that's fair? No, I don't. Uh, the West is not a geographical concept as such, as such. It's a geopolitical concept. In other words, countries that are independent, countries that can build democracies, countries that have a free market, countries that enter alliances of their own choice. And you can't say that about the Russian Federation. Russia has claims on Ukraine as its historical territory, which of course it appropriated under the Tsarist dictatorships. Ukraine was independent, or the pre-Ukrainian state was independent way back in the 9th, 10th centuries. So uh, the West does not end anywhere. The West includes countries that want to be independent, that want their security, that want democracy. Ukraine wants all three. And others will want the same. Belarus, for instance, Instance, once the uh, Lukashenko is ousted, uh, I think there will be more of a turn towards uh, democratic uh, institutions, towards Western institutions. And uh, there are other potential countries in Russian Federation that may want to move closer to the West as well, just as we've seen with countries from the former Soviet Union, like Moldova, like Georgia, even Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan want to move closer to the West. So I don't think the West is this concept uh, that stops at a, ge a, ge uh, a geographical border. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a geopolitical concept. It's a, it's a concept of national uh, independence and national security i'm very glad to hear that because uh, mr putin uh, always wants to go back to 1997 or something like this so what you are uh, saying is very important for us in bulgaria uh, and in the balkan region and in eastern europe as a whole um, because you are uh, such a long year expert in all these think tanks um, and um, analytical uh, funds. I have a very, very particular question about the so-called Russian think tanks. Uh, some Russian intellectuals, uh, NGO leaders, and think tank members who were partnering with the West for a long time took a firm pro-war and pro-Putin stand. For example, Dmitry Trenin, the head of the Moscow-based Carnegie Fund, for so many years, appeared to be a GRU officer. And uh, after 24th of uh, January last year, he now strongly supports the war against Ukraine. He even recently stated at the Conflict Zone show on uh, Deutsche Welle that, I quote, Russia will prevail over the West. My question is, how exactly naive the West has been over the past 20 years in their approach toward key figures in Russia that just pretended to be Democrats. Uh, but in fact, they were part of uh, the Russian special services and um, they were serving Putin's regime quite well in his game of deception. Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, some of us did know, of course, that he was a colonel in the GRU. Training that is, uh, as have other 
uh, so-called uh, political experts that have been courted in the West. I put it this way. If the West has its useful idiots, those that support, uh, that in the past supported communism or Russian imperialism now, uh, the rest, the, uh, the Russians implant their useful stooges in the West. Uh, both Trenin and Karaganov is another figure uh, have actually finally revealed their true colors. Unfortunately, as you said, for many years, they were courted by academia, by the media, uh, as moderates, as people who both know the establishment in Russia, but are very much pro-Western and want to moderate the political system, to introduce reforms. Um, and, and unfortunately, a lot of people bought into this. I think part of the problem, though, is um, Western academia and Western policymaking, which I described in one article as the problem is not Russophobia, it's Russophilia. In other words, there's so much fascination with Russian history interpreted by, of course, by Moscow and by figures such as uh, Trenin and Karaganov that we that we don't understand and we don't uh, sufficiently uh, know the, the aspirations and histories and identities of neighboring peoples like the Ukrainians or the Belarusians or the Tatars or other people uh, now in the, in the Russian Federation. I think so. It's part of a bigger problem, I would say, that, that uh, we, we both listen to stooges that are implanted by special services and at the same time, we uh, in academia particularly, but also in policy making, think of Russia as the center of this uh, East European universe, which is simply not true. Absolutely. Um, following this <clears throat> topic, when we listen to the leaders of the Russian opposition right now, Nobody could hear any real appeals or calls for a revolution in Russia against the regime. Uh, yes, they do want the change of the regime. They want Putin out. But uh, besides from this, we don't hear any other radical statements. So um, no tools are provided to even to, to the Russian uh, public how to do that. For example, recently I, recent, uh, I uh, <coughs> listened to Mr. Khodorkovsky's interview for a very global media and he said that um, ideas like uh, the dissolution of um, Russian Federation are irresponsible so so my question is um, how democratic is the Russian opposition considering the imperialist view of, of Russians all the time yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, there are different kinds of emigres, of course. Um, people like Khodorkovsky, but also Navalny, who sits uh, in a Russian prison at the moment. I would call them liberal imperialists. In other words, they want to maintain the state and think that if Putin and company are replaced by a more reformist regime, therefore all the other republics and regions uh, within Russia would want to stay in one state, that all the nations would want to be part, still part of this uh, this Russian uh, empire. Uh, I think Khodorkovsky is actually being disingenuous because the, the liberal option, the democratic reform option in Russia is mostly abroad. I don't see any indications uh, of, as you said, a democratic revolution. I mean, I don't see the signs of a, a Moscow Maidan, for instance, or a Euro Maidan, or whatever kind of Maidan uh, in Moscow itself. The, 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 the democratic option has been squeezed out. I think the only viable option is actually the dissolution of Russia, um, which I do believe will happen. And this is why I published a book a few months ago on the very subject. Uh, but, you know, in answer to directly to your question, I think uh, it is is wishful thinking to think that Russia will democratize into a state that can cooperate with the West, that will no longer threaten its neighbors with military intervention, as we have seen in Ukraine and Georgia and Moldova, uh, and that can uh, accommodate all the different uh, aspirations of very diverse regions. Remember, Russia's 83 different uh, regions and republics. 22 are ethnic republics. In most of those, the Russian population has been dropping and the majority is a non-Russian. So this is a very explosive situation. If it's not handled through absolute uh, decentralized federalism, which is one option, um, the only solution would be dissolution. And quite frankly, Khodorkovsky 
they talk about decentralization, they talk about democracy, but they're, they're very unspecific and, and are encountering a lot of opposition from regionalist and federalist actors in Russia and outside of Russia. Ah, yes, a lot of ambiguity there. Yes. Uh, is the Wagner Group becoming a real rival power entity to the Russian military, or is it just another power game of Putin and his regime? Yeah, I think we are seeing the beginnings of power struggles, which sometimes break into the open. Um, as, as we know in Russia, there's a lot that's hidden when it comes to the elites, when it comes to the people in the Kremlin and those around them. I would, I would say that there, there, because of the fact that the Russian military has been failing in Ukraine and has lost territory and has lost a lot of equipment, uh, over 200,000 either dead, injured or incapacitated soldiers, uh, which is massive, which is 10 times what they experienced in Afghanistan. As a result of all this, there have been a lot of criticisms of the Russian military leadership, particularly of Defense Minister Shoigu uh, and the Chief of General Staff Gerasimov. Those uh, criticisms come from uh, two main, I would say, private armies, uh, the Prigozhin's uh, Wagner Group, and of course Kadyrov's Kadyrovtsi, you know, the Chechen uh, military that he has under his control. Uh, they've been criticizing the Russian military for being incompetent, for being corrupt, which is absolutely true. Now, the question is, to what degree does Putin control this and use this against the military? Um, I tend to think that he would like to see the military fully in control because this is his main source of, I would say, um, main source of support. There's always a danger that with private armies, particularly with Chechens, that at some point they're going to say, we don't want anything more to do with this. Um, we, we're going to go for independence as well, which 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 wouldn't surprise me in the, in the case of Chechnya. In the case of uh, Prigozhin and the uh, Wagner Group, I think that's a potential threat within Russian society itself, where you have tens of thousands of armed men, including former prisoners, uh, many of whom have been uh, convicted of murder, running around free with weapons. Uh, this is, the, you know, this is a recipe for future violent conflicts, potentially even civil wars within Russia itself. Uh, there's many other factors involved in this. Also, a number of oligarchs, over a dozen oligarchs have, have died in very mysterious circumstances. Uh, so there's a lot of, I would say, um, uh, pow there's power struggles, there's um, uh, purges within the military and within the economic networks controlled from the Kremlin. And uh, this is only the beginning, because as the Russian economy continues to nosedive and as the losses continue to mount in Ukraine, the military losses, um, I think there's, these power struggles are going to come more to the forefront. OK, let's talk a bit about this evil circle, Russia, China, Iran. Um, what is the importance of the Iranian military equipment aid to Russia? Yeah, well, uh, with Iran, look, Russia has uh, failed to assemble a group of allies to support it. Um, even Belarus, as we've seen, has been very reluctant to send any troops to help the Russian forces in Ukraine. They've allowed their territory to be used, but not their troops. Central Asia, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, they've all either um, stayed silent or they have said they, they respect territorial integrity of states, which, of course, means Ukraine's territorial integrity. So Russia has to reach out to other powers, some bigger, some smaller. China has also been reticent um, in giving any military or diplomatic support to Russia. So what they're left with are the most authoritarian uh, states on the planet, North Korea, Iran, um, a couple in South America as well. So th the idea being that Russia wants to assemble some group of allies that it can then claim it's not alone. The world supports it. It has, you know, strong support, strong allied support, strong partners. Iran has been, I think, drawn into this picture. Uh, and again, what the Russians have promised the Iranians behind the scenes, we'll wait and see. I tend to think it's to develop their nuclear potential. Uh, in return, Iran is willing to send uh, and even develop, manufacture drones uh, against Ukraine. Um, North Korea. North Korea has also been sending a lot of ammunition 
uh, to Russia, uh, which indicates also something else, that the Russian military is being depleted. Their munition stocks, their effectiveness of their weapons against Ukrainian defenses and against Ukrainian offense uh, is, is, uh, is actually decreasing. So they have to then get weaponry and ammunition from, as I said, these most authoritarian countries that are willing to stand with them. Yep. The world's leading executioners and human rights violators, Iran and China, are tightening their diplomatic and economic ties. Hudson Research Fellow Ahmed Hashemi explains why China's presence in Iran is not a welcome development for the United States uh, or its Gulf allies. Uh, in his uh, <coughs> recent article in the National Interest magazine, what is, what is the strategic danger of the new China-Iran relations? Well, one has to first of all look at China. China is the much bigger power. It's the second largest economy in the world. Uh, it has ambitions much beyond its borders, uh, both economic and security ambitions. It, it is a threat increasingly, I would say, to the Western world in terms of its values, in terms of its um, undermining of the independence of countries, in terms of its corruption of political leadership, and in terms of its competition, unfair competition, I would say, in terms of trade uh, and economic development, economic investment across Eurasia. And this is where Iran, I think, fits into the picture, both as an economic uh, gateway for uh, Chinese goods, Chinese influence, uh, and it also for China, uh, resources going to China, and on the other hand, uh, curtailing the role of the West. I think this is the aim of China, to become the dominant player uh, <clears throat> in places like the Middle East, in Africa, as we've seen, but also in, in parts of Europe. Um, and with Russia's demise, I think China may see even more of an opportunity to expand its influence in places like Iran, in Central Asia, in in um, Middle East and, uh, and East Africa. So again, China is, is a long-term danger for the United States. Uh, it could even, in the case of, uh, uh, I'm not sure you're going to ask me about Taiwan, it could even lead to a conflict over Taiwan and over part, other parts of the Far East where China has become much more active militarily. Let me add one other thing. W with Russia weakening, and I think uh, potentially in the next few years, some of these uh, Far Eastern uh, regions uh, uh, trying to gain their independence, I think China is going to try and play more of a role in terms of resources in Siberia, in the uh, Pacific region, in access to the Arctic. Um, and this is, I think, where the, the next round of competition uh, with the United States, but also with the Central Asian countries uh, and with other East Asian countries, such as Japan and South Korea, I think they're going to accelerate in the, in the future. Yes, you, you are right about uh, this uh, global Indo-Pacific uh, struggle. So my next next question is: What do you expect to happen this year in the this year into in, into this uh, Indo-Pacific region and South Pacific region? Do you foresee the possibility of China undertaking a military operation against Taiwan? It's it's an incredibly important question, and I think a lot of people in Washington are realizing that in addition, of course, to defending Ukraine and its independence, its dem democratic values, its, its history, its territory, its resources, if Ukraine loses this war, if Russia manages to gain parts of Ukraine or overthrows the government, that will encourage China to do the same in Taiwan. In other words, a, a, a victory for Russia means a victory for China and a future war between China and the United States. A victory for Ukraine will mean that Russian empire begins to shrink and that China will be more, let's say, careful about pushing another military intervention against uh, a country that's much better armed, quite frankly, than Ukraine was at the beginning of the war and a country, Taiwan, to which we are committed to defending. I mean, this could be a direct U.S. military intervention, not with NATO, but U.S. military intervention to help Taiwan. So if China tries to uh, take Taiwan, tries to uh, conquer Taiwan, as the Russians are doing with Ukraine, it will suffer a major defeat. But that signal has to be sent to deter China. 
victory for Ukraine means a victory for Taiwan, and China is less inclined to stage any military provocations. Okay, let's switch to our region here, to, to the Balkans for a bit. Um, recently we see different kinds of uh, new tensions rising here and there on the Balkans. Um, you're a huge expert in this. What do you think? Will Russia succeed in their obvious efforts to try to destabilize the Balkans again? Well, they are trying to destabilize the Balkans and they're working particularly through two people, uh, the president of Serbia, uh, Vucic, and the uh, the head of the uh, government in Banja Luka in the Serb, uh, Republika Srpska, Milorad Dodik. Through these two major actors in the region, they are trying to help Belgrade to create a greater Serbia. It's almost like the Milosevic project, but not with direct war, but with subversion, various hybrid threats, disinformation, corruption, um, destabilizing ethnic relations. So Russia is intent on using the Balkans both to distract the United States and NATO from helping Ukraine, but also to create new problems, what I call an internal front for NATO in which with which it struggles for the foreseeable future. Um, it, it has been successful up to a point because of the fact that we have neglected, when I say we, Washington and Brussels, I think, have neglected Russian penetration of the region. Uh, we have neglected uh, the corruption that's involved. We've neglected, uh, in some cases, particularly in Serbia and Hungary, neglected this energy dependence. Also in Bulgaria, where we've been pushing the Bulgarian government also to become less dependent on Russia, because uh, the, 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 you know these energy uh, tentacles that Russia has are also political tentacles with which they can control these countries. So I think it's extremely important for us to have a policy that counters Russia's offensive in the Balkans in each of these domains, cyber, disinformation, corruption, economic, energy, the use of the Orthodox Church, uh, Russian Orthodox Church is also a major factor of instability in the region. And above all, I think we need to lean on Belgrade because Belgrade is the primary source or conduit, I would say, of Russian destabilization. We need to lean on uh, Belgrade to recognize Kosovo, to eliminate uh, the uh, this so-called humanitarian center, which is a big spy hub uh, for Russia in Nish not far from the Bulgarian border, actually, uh, as well as to um, clean up their media, to allow for a free media, not one that's penetrated and dominated by Russian sources. A lot of work to be done, uh, but I don't think uh, the US and the EU are sufficiently focused as yet on this question. Mm -hmm. How important is Bulgaria for Russia? And how dangerous is that for Bulgaria? Very good question. I think uh, the Kremlin wants to have Bulgaria as another proxy in the region uh, to undermine both the United States, uh, but also wider NATO and European uh, European Union interests. Uh, it already has a reliable proxy in Belgrade, in Serbia, uh, and also in the Republika Srpska, in half of Bosnia and Herzegovina. It also has a reliable uh, let's say, if not proxy, at least a partner in in Hungary with Viktor Orban, who has been a very, he's very much opposed to any sanctions against Russia. He opposes um, military assistance to Ukraine. Um, he has been basically defensive of the Putin regime. I think uh, Putin wants the same thing in Bulgaria. He wants a government, not just the president, but the government in Bulgaria to be outspokenly pro-Russian, to oppose sanctions, uh, either to help uh, Russia in international uh, fora, international diplomatic fora, or to remain neutral either way, but not to oppose Russian policy uh, and not to give uh, the sort of military, uh, economic and political assistance uh, to the government in Kyiv. I think it's clear that Russia still sees Bulgaria as its younger brother, uh, which is exactly how it sees Ukraine. And quite frankly, if Bulgaria had been living next to Russia, it would be facing the same fate that Ukraine is facing now. Uh, so it's in Bulgaria's national interest to make sure it's independent, 
to reclaim its independence, to cut its links with these corrupt Russian um, state actors, um, and to develop, I mean, Bulgaria has potential to be more of a security play in the Black Sea region. One of the re reasons Russia has been trying to, let's say, uh, put pressure on Bulgaria is to get Bulgaria to oppose any kind of black, uh, any kind of presence of NATO in the Black Sea, which Russia wants to dominate. Also, I think Russia has been using Bulgaria to try and destabilize the Western Balkans, uh, particularly over these historical and, and uh, disputes over history and identity and, and so forth with, with Macedonia, with North yes. Macedonia. This plays into Russian hands directly. Uh, and I think that, you know, these disputes over history should be left to the historians. As soon as politicians begin to touch it, there's a hand that tries to manipulate it. And that's what we've seen in the case of Bulgaria. We see this in other parts of the region as well with Croatia and then other countries and Hungary. Um, so to sum up, Bulgaria needs to become fully independent uh, of Russia, not just economically and in terms of its energy, but also politically. In other words, that it is an independent actor and it chooses its alliances and its national interests. Speaking of the Black Sea region, what could we in Bulgaria <clears throat> uh, and in our region expect from the new United States initiative uh, for development of the Black Sea? Yeah, I mean, the, the United States, I think after this war in Ukraine, will become more committed uh, to, let's say, developing several things in the Black Sea. First of all, I would say the the uh, the ability to, for commerce to to traverse freely across the region we've seen uh, across the sea we've seen how russia has blockaded grain for instance for uh, from ukraine uh, particularly in the early parts of the war ukraine is a major grain provider uh, to the third world to many countries in in africa and middle east that depend on it you, uh, russia has tried to blockade uh, the 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 uh, uh, the commerce, the the export of that grain. So one thing I would say is uh, NATO has to secure transportation corridors across the Black Sea, energy corridors across the Black Sea from eastern part of the Black Sea that not, do not go through Russian territory. Um, secondly, I think ports. Ports are extremely important to make sure that Ru Russia or any other country is not able to, to bomb or blockade ports like Kherson or Odessa, uh, or if, if further south, if Russia becomes ambitious towards Romania uh, with Constanza. I mean, all these areas have to be, all these ports have to be kept absolutely free and secure. Thirdly, I would say there has to be, um, there has to, uh, the Black Sea itself is mostly NATO. There's only like 200 miles of, I did a, a survey of this, there's only something like 200 miles of the Black Sea coast that is actually Russia. Uh, if one excludes Crimea, which is not really Russia, it's just been captured by Russia. Russia is a very, sm as well as parts of Georgia, Abkhazia, uh, that, uh, that Russia has captured. The Black Sea, if you include Turkey, Bulgaria, and Romania, are mostly a NATO concern, a NATO security interest. As a result, NATO has to have a bigger and more capable force in the Black Sea to ensure security for all three NATO members, as well as for the South Caucasus. Georgia, remember, wants to be a NATO member as well. It should be allowed the, the, the prospect of safe passage of its military and commercial uh, vessels across the Black Sea. Absolutely. I uh, also think this is... Uh absolutely crucial considering uh, the obvious need for increased very very big increase of uh, nato's presence in uh, our countries here in this region uh, especially in a situation like this one um, we said crimea uh, a lot of people seem to simply not realizing how crucial the crimean issue is um, could you please explain to the public the strategy and the strategic importance of Crimea? Yeah, if you look at the map of the Black Sea, Crimea is absolutely essential. It's it's uh, it's it's a huge peninsula, and whoever controls Crimea can control both the uh, maritime and uh, airspace 
uh, around several hundred miles around the borders of Crimea. In other words, most of the Black Sea, most of the northern part of the Black Sea coast is controlled by whoever controls Crimea. This is why Russia seized Crimea. It's not just for historical reasons um, uh, or, or identity questions, claims to, to, to the territory, but also to, to, as we've seen, to try and blockade Ukrainian ports, to prevent uh, Ukraine having uh, a free and equal trade in the region, basically to strangle the country and to put pressure on it. So Crimea is a, is a major location where Russia have has built up its forces, as you know, in Sevastopol, the port, the, the Navy, uh, but also um, the systems, the air defense systems, um, plus, of course, economically in terms of uh, energy resources. You know, there's several fields in and around Crimea where there are gas and oil fields potential for exploration, exploitation and production. And this is what Russia wants to control as well, even though these fields actually belong to Ukraine or, or a part of international waters. One last thing I would say about the control of Crimea is, of course, um, the, the history of it. You know, Crimea for, for many uh, generations, for many centuries, was neither Ukraine nor Russian. It was Tatar. It was either part of the Ottoman Empire or a separate Crimean Khanate. And it's very important that the indigenous people, the Crimean people who have been uh, terribly treated, not just by Putin, but also previous to that by Stalin, mm -hmm. uh, where they were deported to Central Asia. These people have a right to their territory, a right to their lands, a right to their uh, to their history and a right to, 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 to let's say, live uh, where their ancestors were. So, again, Crimea is an important geostrategic question, but it's also an important democratic question and a question of rights for indigenous peoples. Yes, we also have a uh, Bulgarian minority in uh, Crimea, which was uh, significantly oppressed by Stalin. Those people were killed, Absolutely. tortured, and, deported. Uh, and, and populations like the Balkar population in the Caucasus was also deported by Stalin. So Bulgarians in uh, in both in the Soviet Union, but also in the Tsarist Empire, suffered under the Russian Empire. Uh, there are Bulgarians now in in Ukraine in the. Um, uh, in, in the areas along the Black Sea, Bessarabian areas that are fighting with the Ukrainian army against Russian imperialism. Yes. Uh, you know, so these people should not be forgotten. They, these are brave Bulgarians that are fighting for Ukraine's independence. They should be, they should be, uh, let's say, get more publicity and should be helped much more, I would think, in Bulgaria, which is them ultimately their mother country. Yes. Um, over the years, you have made predictions and so many of them have become true. What should be your prediction? What would be your prediction for the global security development? Uh, from the perspective, perspective of the present Russian war against Ukraine. Yeah, I, I would say this is the theme of my new book, which is uh, <laughs> Russia's rupture, uh, Russia's collapse, which I think will happen. Uh, I can't tell you exactly how, uh, exactly when, but I develop various scenarios in the book which details uh, um, different ways in which Russia's regions and republics will try and break free. Look, the war in Ukraine uh, is, is, is it, it, it's, it's a, I would say, game changer for Russia itself. It's a tectonic shift in its ability to project power. Um, it, it will start, I believe, power struggles and economic decline, unrest in the regions, which will culminate in several parts of Russia wanting to be free of Moscow's control. And this is going to be a huge game changer in terms of um, international reaction. I don't think we have a policy yet to try and deal uh, with the collapse of Russia. We didn't have a policy for the collapse of the Soviet Union or the Soviet bloc 30 years ago. And unfortunately, uh, both Brussels, neither Brussels nor Washington have a policy to handle a country, a large country, that borders uh, dozens of states where there are huge aspirations, growing aspirations and anger at Moscow. Uh, what happens when this country begins to rupture? How do we help these countries uh, stabilize uh, these emerging states? How do we involve 
ourselves diplomatically, economically? How do we deal with Moscow uh, in in when it's turned inward on its own survival? This, I think, is going to be a major challenge for international security over the next ten, if not more, years. And um, it's it's it, it, it. On the one hand, it's very exciting, and and there's a lot of opportunity. On the other hand, there are dangers as well involved uh, in terms of potential wars, potential civil wars, uh, potential uh, similar scenarios to what we've witnessed in Ukraine or what we witnessed in Yugoslavia, remember, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So, yeah, I mean, that would be my sort of major uh, strategic tectonic shift over the next few years. And here we <clears throat> are approaching our final question. Um, will the United States continue to be so firm and dedicated to the issues we just outlined uh, with you in our uh, interview. Will the internal political fights inside the United States impact in some way American foreign policy? Yes, they do Im impact on foreign policy, but it's not as um, it's not as straightforward as some have said. In other words, both within the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, there are st still a strong core of internationalists who understand U.S. national interests, uh, who understand the importance of NATO, who understand uh, the rivalries that America faces vis-a-vis -vis Russia and China, but also with Iran, North Korea and other countries that want to develop nuclear weapons. So I would say the core of American policy making is firmly rooted in internationalism and America's responsibility. I mean, look, quite frankly, if you look at what's happening in Europe, in Ukraine, if there was no America, Europe would be so divided that Russia would have won. And Russia would have been threatening Poland, Baltic states, Romania, uh, other countries in the region, quite frankly, because of its uh, gaining its ambitions and its aspirations. Because of America, uh, Europe has stood firm. Europe has resisted. Ukraine has resisted. And Russia is now on the verge of defeat. So America is the key power, not only for, uh, I would say, uh, uh, democracies, but also even more importantly for the independence of and sovereignty of countries that want to choose their alliances and their national interests. So uh, I would, you know, in some I would say, regardless of some parts of the Republican Party and even some parts of the Democratic Party that are more isolationist, in other words, Trump or the so-called progressives in the Democrat Party, there is a core of, of, of Republicans and a core of Democrats who will continue to work together on international security issues. And we saw this even during the Trump administration, where the vast majority in the Senate uh, supported NATO enlargement and supported assistance, military assistance for Ukraine. Yes, uh, what you said sounds very encouraging and optimistic, and this is very important for for us in Bulgaria and in uh, in, in in throughout uh, Eastern Europe. It, it is obvious that the biggest guarantee, security guarantee, we have is um, our allies. NATO and the United States is the biggest player and uh, actually the biggest uh, guarantee of uh, the security in our region. So what you've been saying is it's important to us to know that uh, in spite of all political troubles or political fights, which are normal for internal politics in any country, it is great to hear that the United States will be uh, tough, firm and responsible all the time. Uh, Right now, after this Russian terrible aggression against uh, Ukraine, after this genocidal war, uh, it's obvious that we are threatened here. And um, so, please, very, very final question. Um, do you think that the United States will be more proactive in, in terms of... Uh, military support, infrastructure, development of the region of the Black Sea, making sure that these regions will never go back to Russia. 
Yeah, I mean, I've been urging proactive policy and, and uh, a lot of people uh, that I know in Washington have also been urging a proactive policy where, whereby America prevents conflicts by getting more involved and assisting countries to build up the defenses. And actually, I do believe that NATO enlargement has prevented Russia from striking certain countries. The three Baltic countries that are very small, very vulnerable to Russia are a perfect example. Since they've been in NATO, Russia doesn't touch them. You know, it threatens, uh, it, uh, it engages in hy hybrid attacks and so forth. But militarily, I think that they are now reasonably safe, particularly if Ukraine were to win. So a proactive approach should also mean helping those countries that are key um, in major regions. And let me give you an example. In the South Caucasus, we have a country, Azerbaijan, that's absolutely key both for uh, transportation routes, energy supplies uh, that bypass Russia, that, that are not controlled by Russia. It's important, Azerbaijan is important for stability in a region that's also threatened by Iran. Uh, so th this, to me, is a is an absolutely major player where we should be more proactive. Similarly, I would say in uh, Central Asia, uh, in the case of Kazakhstan, which is a major, the major player in Central Asia that prevents both Chinese and Russian dominance. Again, I think more proactive policies are needed to support these countries to make them feel um, make them feel more secure, both diplomatically, economically, and in terms of their security, their defense. So, yeah, in answer to your question, absolutely, we sh we should be more proactive, never proactive enough. So we're going to keep pushing, um, particularly to in order to prevent conflicts or once conflicts begin, to make sure that national independence and sovereignty are respected, and empires are not successful. Professor Janusz Bogajski, thank you so much for this interview, sir. Thank you for asking. And I hope that in the near future we'll be able to continue this uh, discussion with you. Thank you. Absolutely. My pleasure. I look forward to next time. Same here. Thank you, Professor Bogajski. Thank you so much. This has been my exclusive interview with Professor Janusz Bogajski, a senior fellow at the Jamestown Foundation in Washington, D.C. I'm looking forward to continuing interviewing global security experts from all over the world. I thank you all for being together tonight with Visible and Invisible Counter Propaganda with me, Svet Dineham. I will see you next time. Until then, you may like, follow, and share our Visible and Invisible Facebook page, follow me on Twitter, subscribe to our YouTube channel, or support us on Patreon. Thank you all. Stay cool as usual. Have a good one. Thank you.